Boy, and what is Bev doing in the supply closet, Ashley? She's messing oh. with Chekhov's rat poison. Listen here, Chekhov's rat poison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Flan Again, a Mike Flanagan rewatch, brought to you by the Articulate Coven. For more information on the original Anne Rice fan podcast and community, visit articulatecoven.com and find more about this show at articulatecoven.com slash Flan Again. Welcome to Flan Again, a Mike Flanagan rewatch <laughs> podcast from Articulate Coven. We are your hosts. I'm Joel. I'm Ashley. And we are the Articulate Coven. Yay! Hello! Um, so for our listeners that uh, don't watch the videos or that maybe haven't kept up with social media, you're like, what happened to the theme music? It's different. Okay, so here's what happened. We started this little uh, trip into Midnight Mass, the world of Mike Flanagan, and right. we announced last week that we're going to spin off and make its own feed. If you're an Articulate Coven listener, and that's where you're listening to this or watching it, Last week, I left our theme song and our intro in so it wouldn't freak you out. But now you should know <laughs> some idea of what you're doing. So from for the rest of this run, we're just going to make one version of the video and, and one version of the audio. It will go into the separate feeds. And that way, if you're just a Mike Flanagan fan, you don't have to subscribe to our Anne Rice stuff. Although, I will tell you, occasionally we're going to mention something from it. that because it'll come up in the follow-ups. Yes, and that's the other thing. I really do think... There are people who are going to find our discussions because they're Mike Flanagan fans, and then they're going to enjoy our conversation enough. Well, if these folks are in love with, with that Anne Rice show, let me go check it out. Let me give it even a Even if you haven't read her books. Yeah. Even if you haven't read her books. The adaptation of Interview with a Vampire on, from fantastic. AMC that's on Netflix right now, it really is top-notch. And if you're enjoying yeah. this level of horror with pathology and societal con you know commentary or whatever mm – -hmm. That, that's Anne Rice, folks. You're going to dig it there, too. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's All an right. easy crossover. Um, yeah, it really is. All right, let's get into some follow-up before we get started about this episode. Awesome. We're going to be talking in tonight's episode about Book 2 Psalms from Midnight oh, Mass. So uh, but we have a lot of great feedback from Episode 1 uh, that I want to discuss here. The first thing, Ashley, and you and I actually did this off the air about two or three days after we recorded. You messaged me out of the blue, and you said... Is it, is it, uh, it's not the nativity. No, that's not the word you suggested. What was <laughs> yeah, the word that no, you suggested? Was, uh, 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 epiphany. 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 Yes. Okay. So we were talking about in episode one, we were discussing Bev, uh, Bev Keen had a problem with the, the new, uh, priest, Father Paul, because he was wearing his gold robes, not his green robes, which mm. would be inappropriate How outside dare. of holiday time. How and dare. And we said, yeah, indeed. We said, you know, there's like Lent and there's Easter and there's the Christmas one. What's the Christmas one? You suggested epi epiphany. <laughs> Apparently you like oh, shouted it out loud. It was like an epiphany. It was like, uh, yes. And it, <laughs> you know how that shit happens like in the middle of the night? You're like, oh, that was it. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So but it's not, I had forgotten. But it's not epiphany. I had forgotten to ask Kelly, my wife. I was like, I know Kelly will know. As soon right. as we get off this recording, I'll ask her and she'll tell me the word and then I can fix it and we'll talk about it next week. But I just forgot about it. So you messaged me about Epiphany and I was like, that's not it. But let me that's ask Kelly. <laughs> yeah. We did our So Kelly told then. me. But then we also got a comment on the YouTube. This comes from Alfie Holmes, so I'll give them credit. That word you were looking for is Advent. Advent. There's a whole it's calendar, four weeks. Ashley. That's right. There's literally, they, we, they sell calendars. Did you know, by the way, this year they're selling Halloween Advent, Advent's not the right word, but they're selling Halloween Advent calendars, Halloween countdown calendars. That's very that fun. That you can buy. Um, quite into so that, So the word actually. you're looking for is Advent. Right, right. It's four weeks leading up to Christmas, a time mm -hmm. of spiritual preparation for the birth of Christ. I remember getting up early every week, uh, every weekday before sunrise and going to church for an Advent Mass with my paper lantern, either DIY or store-bought, right before school. I still remember how cold I felt walking up to church surrounded by other kids with their little lanterns. It looked magical, but it wasn't a pleasant experience. <laughs> oh, that sounds so precious, though. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Alfie says, I'm assuming this is a uniquely European tradition. I come from a very Catholic oriented country uh, and we actually got similar comments, uh, you know, as far as like religion in Europe versus religion in yeah. uh, the States and how it is a, a little bit different. It is interesting to me. I say Europe. I assume that there was speaking of a European country. They might not right. have been now that I think about it. There aren't that many European countries that are Catholic dominated these days. Um, 
But this show in particular, I think, does very much hearken to an American branch of of religion, even Catholicism. Um, it feels but, like that to me. But, I mean, I don't have anything to compare it to as far as, like, how religion is practiced in other countries. I mean, how, how yes. like, Catholicism is practiced in other countries. Like, what the subtle so, differences or very big differences might be, you know? Uh, so Pamela Boyle was commenting along those lines. So I binge watched this whole series this week in preparation for the podcast. First, Ooh. you're not the only one, uh, Pamela. Oh. I heard from a few people that hadn't seen this before and they said, how am I not binge watching this? I want to yeah. wait and watch it with your episodes, but binge it if fair, you must. I binged Ashley it. Ashley and I both binged it. Yes. We binged it originally and then we binged it recently. And mm-hmm. then now we're going back episode by episode to watch it. So. Yeah, and I've hyper. This has been a hyperfixation show for me um, at various <laughs> times. So I've I couldn't even begin to tell you how many times I've watched this from start to finish. Like it I is say, interesting. It's double digits for sure. That's for okay, sure. That's impressive. It's interesting to me though that this one hit so hard for you because you aren't from a religious background. No, I think that that's. I, I don't know. It's just, it's a, I mean, it's a great story regardless. And I am interested. I find religion yes. interesting and I find spirituality even more interesting than religion. Um, because I, I think I'm a, I am a very spiritual person. Um, so I find it all, I mean, I do find it all fascinating. And then I find how people behave when they're in the throes of like religious ecstasy and, and kind of, you know, lunacy. Like I'm very interested in how that shakes out and what that's like. That, uh, I mean, you, I can, what, from what I hear is like, you identify a lot with Riley probably. Cause that's right. Yeah. Like Riley wants to fall back into this, this childhood faith that he had, but he's just not there and can't see how he can ever get there again. Yeah. I mean, it would watching with yeah. wide eyes while everyone around him enjoys a religious, you know, fervor. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Anyway, uh, Pamela says first, if I had known that the vampires were involved, I would have been all over this. <laughs> Second. <laughs> well- Mike Flanagan and I apparently grew up in the same Catholic church. Here I am watching this series <laughs> singing word for word with every hymn the congregation is singing in church. He also Excellent. uses the form of the mass that I grew up with, not the newer version adopted somewhere in the 2000s or late 90s. Talk about trauma flashback, but somehow comforting too. <laughs> right. Um, I appreciate how new, boy, that's like the tagline for this series. It's a trauma flashback, but somehow comforting too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like rice with religious trauma in it. I don't know what to tell it, you. Like it's it, yeah, it's like a nice bowl of gumbo with trauma with your trauma. Um, I appreciate how nuanced the cultist behaviors are presented here. Mm-hmm. I blurted out Jonestown at one point, and I loved how the scene in the classroom. Uh, oh, w- w- that's from a later episode. Allows the sheriff to explain the Bible versus Quran, mm-hmm. even how Riley explains his atheist view and so forth. The whole series is so on point with how groupthink can so easily get out of hand Ooh. very easily. And since I was educated by Catholic nuns, Bev's attitude was also on point as the perfect Catholic, looking down on everyone because she knows better than you. Um, mm-hmm. She's horrible. Louis, Louis is also a victim of that specific form of Catholic guilt because his mother had that same attitude, and so did his brother Paul. Love your podcast. Can't wait for the next ones. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Pamela. Mm-hmm. That's so true. That's his, Louis is a very good a, a good mirror for some of this too. Yeah, for sure. That is that is absolutely true. Mm, um, bless. All right, this was a great conversation that I was not expecting, honestly. Although I guess I knew some of our audience wouldn't be interested in, in Mike Flanagan discussion, which is one of the reasons why I thought, Hey, we ought to start a separate feed right. for folks. And that way keep them, you know, get your peanut butter out of my chocolate, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, but Donnie verbalized some of this and then took it further than I was expecting. And it's interesting. I want to have this conversation with you. Donnie says, I try not to drop feedback if it's not positive. So don't get me wrong. I know Flanagan is doing great work and is well loved, but for some reason it's just not for me. Something about his stuff always gives me those vibes of pretentiousness and self-indulgence ah. and listening to him on podcasts talk about his work has only made it worse. Besides that, his scripts and direction always lack depth and vibrance to me. I'll watch along and we'll try to pick up on your enthusiasm, but so far I couldn't connect. <laughs> if it stays this way, I guess maybe I'll skip out. 
Uh, P.S. What cool software are you using for recording? If you don't mind me asking, I'm kind of a nerd that always is curious about anything. I mentioned this in the last episode. We, we got this actually a few weeks ago, um, mm-hmm. but in particular, it's going to be great for when you and, and Brett are doing your recordings. Cause I'll have the files automatically. You won't have to upload anything. It's Riverside. Riverside.fm is the software that we use. Uh, if you're interested, by the way, if you're listening to us and you're like, Hey, I've thought about starting a podcast on X or Y or Z or whatever feel free to comment and ask me for feedback on that. It's what I do for a living. I'm it's happy to give you some his, feedback on. It's literally his dorb. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm dorb. happy to give you some some feedback on, um, you know, tools or tricks or whatever to get started or something that you can make it a little easier on yourself. I will say it's always like a trade-off of money and time, right? And which is the more valuable resource or the more available resource for you at the time. Right. When I was young, I did a lot of stuff the hard way because I didn't have any money to spend on it and I did have <laughs> copious amounts of time, <laughs> right? Time. <laughs> don't have any time these days and anything that I can use to streamline our process. I try to do, um, Donnie Canone also says, so, so he and I had a back and forth on the Mike Flanagan of it, of it all. And I was like, man, I hate to hear that, but I absolutely understand. And yeah. I have heard from other people like, boy, he monologues, don't he, you know, or whatever. Yeah. I tend to like them, but I can understand why they would ring wrong for some, I used to be a huge Kevin Smith fan, for instance, same sort of thing there, right? It's mm-hmm. this unrealistic, opining sort everybody is an intelligent <laughs> you know english major and glad to expound yeah. on all of their personal problems um the pretentiousness though and and then he went on to say like feels like he's kind of like a trauma tourist sometimes like these things that he talks about in his show it feels like like he's holding somebody else's issues out so that you don't ever get to see his anyway i Oh, this is not like Donnie thought. didn't make any allegations about Mike no, Flanagan being no, no, a terrible, no. per- terrible person. We haven't heard that or anything, but I will say, I know he's a, I know he's a, he's sober. I know he's in recovery. That a he's recovering. recovering so, okay. So there you go. Yeah. So that at least trauma is real. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's compare this though, to someone who has had real allegations of real issues and, and has sort of soured his fandom. Josh, uh, Josh, Josh Whedon. <laughs> Josh Whedon. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about you. I grew up being a huge Buffy fan. Yep, I liked the movie. I loved the TV show when he got a second draft of it. I loved Firefly. I, I watched all the so things. So excited anytime his name was attached to anything anything that I liked and was excited about, you know, and it's such a bummer. Such a bummer. It, I mean, and anybody that hasn't looked into the allegate, there are a lot the, the main thing that is true is he was a dictator on set and was <laughs> very, very asshole. cruel yeah. to especially female cast members over the years. Uh, yeah. And there are some horror stories out there. I, I don't believe he's had any, you know, like rape allegations or anything like no. that. But it does seem like he was a little bit of a creep with There's some, some creep female vibe, fans sure. at times. And, well, and with some of the younger, I think some of the younger yeah. act- actresses felt a little, uh, a little bit. And, you know, I think he maybe commented on bodies more than he probably should have and things like that. You know, I mean, that feels well, like Well, and he put vibe. it in the scripts. He put yeah. it in his scripts. Like, yeah. there's a whole, in particular, the thing that was so obvious to me is there's a, there's a huge joke in his version of the Justice League about the Flash falling on Wonder Woman. And, oh, mm-hmm. we squished our body parts together, effectively. And you're like, right. are you 12? Like, what? Yeah. Like, my 15-year-old wouldn't laugh at that joke. Not, well, I mean, <laughs> right. he sort of did laugh at that joke, honestly. But anyway. He's 15. Yeah. There's well, nothing like this. that about Flanagan. There's not. Yet. And 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 <laughs> there was there was an issue on the Usher uh set. Fall That's what I wanted Usher. you to talk about cuz I know yeah. you have seen that you're going to talk about it on the show but yeah. but talk a little bit about that. Who was so, the original cast member? Do you remember? Fuck. Let me look. Let me look because it is important to this conversation um uh because it is like it's like a fucking was, like uh, Was it Frank Langella? It was Frank Langella. That's, I, I was I, thinking yeah, it was I think him. it was Frank Langella. Yeah. He had filmed it all, pretty much. I mean... Wow, was, I didn't like, realize he, that. He had filmed so much of it. So basically what, what happened... Now, I had to really kind of dig to get the details because it's not like... It's not like anybody was like being closed mouth about it or there were like some NDAs or anything. It's just that like, people weren't really talking about it. But finally, um, uh, uh, his uh, Flanagan's wife... Um, whose name, uh, Kate, uh, Kate Siegel. She, Siegel, yeah. She, yeah, she was on a podcast and she finally kind of talked about it. And what had happened was he was just being, like he would obviously an older, old, old guy. And he was making a lot of like off-color jokes and things on set and being like that kind of creepy old man sort of thing. But then they have like an intimacy coordinator and he was doing scenes with 
a very young a very young and very unexperienced actress and and was not being respectful of what was choreographed and was not being respectful of her and her wishes and they fucking fired his ass and it's probably the best thing that happened to that because uh <laughs> the guy that ended up playing usher was so fucking great i mean it was the best performance but there was a lot like there was so much of it that was done and it wasn't like it wasn't the best move to make financially i'm sure you know sure. like I'm sure he got fucking paid and it was done, you know, but, um, but yeah, I, and that's something I, I makes me respect him a lot because that's hard to fucking do replace someone when you've already done everything pretty much, you know? Um, but yeah, anyway, so that's kind of the scoop on that. I mean, I do think he must create some sort of a comfortable vibe on set because for that everybody to continues happened. to work for him too. Right. Um, and what, what Kate said was that it, she was pissed because, yeah. because this created this like unhealthy environment on set, on a set that wasn't that way and should not be that way, you know? And then it made people like talk about it. And she was like, I don't want people to be talking shit about our sets, you know, when they're like, we try so hard to keep them safe and awesome you know and i think that i think he probably wrote his actors really hard for uh hill house because i've heard that that was not the greatest experience as far for even from him that filming process with netflix just wasn't the best and it was hectic and hard and and at times like stressful and not great so i mean i, I get that you know i get that he's not he's definitely not a perfect you know a perfect director producer etc um but I mean, he has shown signs of being, you know, a good guy. Yeah. At least on the right side of, of those sorts of issues in particular. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the fact of the matter is that as anytime you are, <laughs> anytime you are doing a project like this, where we're going to be talking about one creator's work in particular, as opposed to like a genre as a whole or something, you, you do think, well, we're kind of hitching our wagon to like this crew and boy, I hope it's all a good choice, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, um, we talk about that a lot. Yeah, and and <laughs> you and I talked off air a minute ago, like with the Anne Rice stuff. Anne is past now, and yeah. there's, there's, there'll be no new flubs out of her uh, publicly when she's speaking <laughs> we won't or have anything. To be gassed by her flappers. Yeah, yeah, and I mean there won't be there there wasn't with her because as an author, it's not like she she doesn't work collaboratively like a director does. You know, she doesn't have a whole crew around her to share a creative vision. She wouldn't even let the editor in, right? She's just doing right. it all herself. So yeah, it really she is keeps a different everything process. close to the vest. Yeah, it is. Well, and 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 uh, yeah, it's writing writing versus even writing a novel for yourself versus being a writer in a writer's room. You know. It's well, I'll say this, even different. on this show where we literally use his name in the title, it is not just about Mike Flanagan. It is about the crew that he builds around himself. It's like when we're talking about an interview with a vampire, we praise Roland mm -hmm. Jones, but it's not just Roland Jones. It's the entire creative crew that he Absolutely. and Mark Johnson have brought in to bear on that show. And any one of them could be removed or replaced in one way or another, and the whole would still function probably in a very similar way to how we have enjoyed it already. So like that's, that's another thing that I sort of like think to myself is, is we are applauding and discussing and acknowledging the creative work of the whole team yeah, here. Absolutely. You know, we absolutely. think this cast is great. And I think his cinematographer is great. And I think the music production on this show is fantastic. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's all of a piece. Uh, last thing from Donnie there. So he, I had given him some feedback and been like, Hey, you know, I hope you can at least enjoy our discussion of it, you know, we'll absolutely pick apart the things that, that are, um, you know, a little lacking in the series or whatever. And he had said in his final comment, one more note, your, your interactions with the fans, not only me are absolutely gorgeous, by the way. Mm -hmm. And in regards to having something to listen to, I can quote at least five things from this episode alone, zero from the actual shows episode. So there's that. <laughs> 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 thank you, Donnie. Well, thank you, Donnie. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, guys, we're not like, we're not leaving behind the vampires and Anne Rice at all. So do not worry about that. If this isn't your jam, well, there's more content coming. Don't you worry your pretty little head about it. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Ashley, I had not looked this up. It just occurred to me. Uh, we've got a comment from Nicole M. Radiant Baby. She says, uh, just started watching this for the first time since you guys are covering it. Only on the first episode so far, but was excited to see Louis Moffat, son of genius writer Stephen Moffat, 
who wrote stuff like Doctor Who, Sherlock, etc., uh-huh. is in this, hoping for the best with the show, especially as an ex-Catholic. So I had to look it up. Who is, uh, is Louis Moffat? He's an English actor and musician. He plays Uker in Midnight Mass. Oh, he's the he's one of the altar boys. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's my the gosh. bigger altar boy. Yeah, yeah, he's the uh, taller one. He's, uh, what's Riley's brother? Uh, uh, Warren, it's his, his, his friend. Yeah. Warren's buddy. Warren's buddy. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Nicole also says, and this was amazing feedback. Was, we were discussing at the very beginning of last episode, we were talking about how Riley had just really screwed his parents in all sorts of ways with his, mm. um, drunk driving incident and, and the, the death of this poor girl. Uh, Nicole says Riley's parents would have had to pay ongoing fees for Riley when he was in prison too. Yeah. Real talk. My dad got out of prison last year. Long story, but he was in there about five-ish years. And the biggest surprise for me was not only did my mother have to pay for his clothes and basics, toothbrush, toothpaste, etc., because you're not allowed to bring anything in with you, but she had to pay for all his food, too, and some other monthly fees. Uh, Like, she was paying several, several hundred dollars a month for him every month on a fixed income they're in their 70s and that's one fixed income because social security paused sending money for for dad while he was incarcerated i assumed you had free room and board in prison but nope ashley i assume first of all thank you for sharing that nicole and i'm so sorry to hear about your issues and i'm glad that your dad is out and i'm hoping everything is headed back to wonderful (laughs) um but Holy shit, man. I just assumed that's why you didn't make any money from your work, right? Like you get, you, we talk all the time right. about how uh, uh, incarcerated people are forced to do work of some kind, most of them, and then they're paid, you know, cents every hour, whatever it is, 35 cents or something. I what? assumed that was because they were taking out your room and board. What are, what is, what are my tax dollars paying for? I'm serious. Like what, what, how, how do we expect, how do we expect someone to come out of jail? Well, like, first of all, what is the point of jail? That's what we need to add, right. ask ourselves as a society, right? Like, is it to punish people? Is it to make us feel better? Is it to rehab individuals who have, you know, moved away from the societal norms that we want people to follow that are impacting society in a negative way in some fashion and get them back on the straight and narrow, so to speak, but make them productive members of society, right? That's what I thought it was about. And if that's what it's about... How are we doing that by bankrupting these families and putting them in, you know, like a permanent debt situation? <sighs> Never mind the fact that once you're a felon or even somebody with a misdemeanor, oh, your almost, employment like, opportunities are, are shrunken. Yeah, yeah, and, like and housing and everything. We man. don't make re- we don't make reentry into society easy. Fuck, man. That's a, I need to do some more research about our prison system. I mean, I know a lot of the Listen. bad shit about our prison system, but like. That's the, if that's you the, haven't seen it, mm. watch the thirteenth oh. on Netflix. I'm sure, I'm assuming you've seen this, mm-hmm. uh, Ashley. Yes, I watched it late. I watched it like a year or two after it came out. I think. I believe Ooh. the title of the of the documentary is just the thirteenth. It's about the thirteenth amendment, the idea that it banned slavery except in cases of incarceration, mm-hmm. and forced slavery in America is still absolutely legal yeah. if you're incarcerated. And that's 100%. why, like in Louisiana, especially, we have literally got prison camps, y'all. They are yeah. labor camps. Yeah, Louisiana and Arkansas in particular have have a reputation of having very, very, very horrible prison systems. <laughs> Just throwing I mean, that out there. Like like cool hand Luke shit today. That's y'all, legit it is not a in joke. Louisiana. It is yes. absurd. It's absurd. Like, um just now right. shutting down spaces that like ju- like they had juveniles in fucking what's that what's the prison down there that's so awful? Um Well, I mean Angola's the worst one, Angola, but they don't have any juveniles in that. That's no, the federal they prison. Didn't. They don't have they, they had juveniles in Angola? I am almost ninety nine percent sure that, that was like a year ago something that was going on. And they so were Angola it is a huge, is, it's a plantation, y'all. Like when you see it on the map, when you look at it, where it is, and historically what that land was, oh they literally God. just took the plantations and made them prisons. And it is, it's crazy making to see people justify it and argue why it's a good system and why it's I, still what we need to do. Anyway, I mean, my sympathies, Nicole. Like We could do a whole fucking podcast, apparently, yeah, about this. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, all right, Nicole had some comments though on the Catholicism of it all. She says, I recently saw a meme calling the host communion wafers Jesus, and that's never <laughs> not going to make me laugh. 
Nope, I love it. Yeah, that's real good. Um, fun to hear you guys talking Catholicism, by the way. I went to a Catholic school briefly as a kid, third to fifth grade. My family's mostly, mostly Catholic, though I stopped attending Mass in early high school mm -hmm. and have not identified as Catholic since. So it amuses me to remember all the weird rules about things like communion. And you're right. If you've not had a recent confession, you shouldn't take communion, or so we were taught in the many weeks of Sunday school classes to learn about <laughs> such things for our first communion at seven to eight years old. Um, I had that actually come up once when I was 17, and a friend of mine was trying to get me to rejoin the church and invited me on a youth group to Florida. I was pretty finally, I was pretty firmly a witchy pagan at the time, so I Excellent. hadn't had confession in years. <laughs> So when I'm at mass with the youth group, I sat back and skipped the communion. After several, afterwards, several of the kids, many who I didn't know, had a go at me for it, accusing oh. me of thinking I was too good for the sacrament. I explained that I was trying to be respectful, and just about then, one of the priests walked by and said, she did it right. No need to shame her. Oh, uh, nice. And they were mad because they thought I was a Satanist. I wasn't, <laughs> and yet I knew more about their religion than they did. And so I commented, and I said, like, I think this entire series is trying to remind people how many individuals, and maybe you are one of them, have has lived a life with faith in it, but you've never examined that faith in any mm -hmm. way. Like, Ooh. there's there's yeah. nothing in this show, I think, that is actually anti-Catholic. It's anti-examination. If that's yeah. what the show is, it's like, it's like, or it's anti, anti examination, I guess, you know, it's pro examination. Yeah. You need to, <laughs> you need to, I mean, in the, question the Bible things, even like... says it, the, literally the Bible says, work out your faith with fear and trembling. Like the, the idea that you can't get together with your God and, and work this out for yourself, figure out what it is that you believe and what you want to hold to and what right. you need to do in your life to and feel weird... like you have that connection. The weird thing is, to me, I feel like church leaders are should be able to have those conversations with people. They should be able to to have those conversations. They should be prepared to have those conversations with their their you know their folks. I don't can't think of the word congregation. They're congregants. You know? Yeah, yeah, they're congregants. They should be able to have those conversations and not be uncomfortable with it. There's so many religion religions that are so anti questioning you know like if you come in and you're like well this seems kind of strange i just would really like an explanation or maybe you could walk me through some of this and they're like nope nope we don't ask questions we just push forward onwards and yeah. upwards or you don't go upwards <laughs> if 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 you can't if your faith particularly if your faith leaders cannot withstand some light genuine seeking and question yeah. asking and you know confirmation and discussion like what are we even doing yeah. All right. Thank you all for the feedback. Anybody that's got some, we love it. Put it in the comments. Put it in our Facebook Please. group. Let us know what's happening. Especially if we fuck up something. Yes. Like, we don't oh, mind a yes. correction. If yeah, we're, absolutely. like, totally off base, like, help us out. Get us where we need to be. <laughs> Lord. Uh, I want to remind everybody, you can get these videos always early and ad-free on our Patreon. Uh, all you yep. got to do is go to articulatecoven.com slash join, $2 a month or more. Get you access to all of our content early. Um, yeah. All right. Let's get into this. Book all two, right. Psalms from Midnight Mass. Originally aired September 24th, 2021. Uh, and it was directed by Mike Flanagan, written by Mike Flanagan, Jamie Flanagan, and uh, Elin, uh, or Ellen Gale. Uh, and that's about it. Let's get into it. Um, oh. first thing I want to talk about is cat puppets, Ashley. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we got, okay. When we watched this the first time, I remember telling Kelly that I felt like they had skipped somehow on the animal animatronics it comes up in a few, uh, times across the course of this series. Yes. And then you and I watched a little TV show called interview with a vampire where they did not skip at all on the budget of season one. No. Which included a couple of animal cats. animatronics, yeah. some cats, and a fox. You remember the fox oh, yeah, is the, the one fox in particular. Was, yes, the fox at the dinner table. They're no table. better than these. Guess what, guys? It's very hard to make a non-Uncanny uh, Valley animal robot, it's, it turns out. They just, why does it look like a stuffed animal? It's so weird to me. Like, my brain turns it in. And maybe that's what it is. It is that, like. I mean, that's effectively, yeah, it's got some servos in it. it. Yeah, my brain's turning it into a stuffed animal. It's like, that looks like. A toy I used to have on my bed, you know, and he uses, we've got dead cats in another, um, Flanagan with a uh, Hill house and they're like, oh, kittens, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, and they're still a little like off and weird. Like it's just not quite right. And then, and this, they're everywhere. They're fucking all over the yeah, beach. There's a bunch, like, there's we, a bunch of cats. 
There's a bunch of dead cats on the beach. Like we wake up. That's a fucking thing to wake up to, you know. Big storm. Isn't it? Dead cats on the beach. Yeah. They're everywhere. They're, They're everywhere, everywhere, friend. Um, yeah. Yeah, but honestly, I think it's just difficult to do. I think that is very. Yeah. Di- it's one of those things that the human brain our brains, and our visual our system fuck with it. It's very, very. We know what an what an animal's movement looks like, and that yeah. ain't it. And so, mm. and on the flip side, it's one of those things like you you hear people complain about using um, the the CGI gun blasts in filming mm. now. And they're like, yeah. we used to just use the prop guns. Yeah, listen. Turns out sometimes, and they're like, "Oh, two times in the history of Hollywood, somebody died." And I'm like, two times is too many. Like, yeah. we don't need that. It's not, not a even, problem. Yeah, that's absurd. It's not a problem. Like, yeah. yeah, no. We can. So, there's things we can do that are not, you know, unsafe for people. For fuck's sake. I mean, this isn't unsafe, but it is unsafe right. for the animals in this case, right? right? And that's Absolutely. the thing. Like, you, do, what are you going to do? You're going to hold the dog down and and make it? How are you going to make a oh. dog fake vomit later? Uh, you know, that, like, what are you doing? Yeah, that that scene. I I have to fast forward every single time though, because that really that's fair, man. That, I, I watched it the first time I watched it, and, and I was like, "Oh, I gotta warn people." <laughs> so like my friends that were starting to watch it, I was like, "Okay, I gotta I gotta the dog dies, the dog dies. I gotta give you a dog dies warning. Dog dies." <laughs> that's fair. The dog dies. That's fair. Like you gotta know before you get into it. Okay, my first suspicion really of the town at large did uh-huh. not come in episode one in the, in episode one, I'm just mad at Bev and I'm like, Bev's right. a bitch. Mm. And now there's this vampire box that's come to town. Those two things mm-hmm. are probably going to be a problem, but the rest is just, these are all lovely people. I'm right. super, super, super on point at the beginning of this episode. Cause the mayor shows up at the beach and immediately starts talking this all away. There's, Hundreds of cats dead right. and piled up on your beach. None of them with right. blood in them, by the way. And the right. mayor's like, oh, you know, one time Ooh. starlings, starlings just dropped out of the sky. Whole flock. Okay. But for fucking real, that happened in BB, Arkansas. Like, Did it really? <laughs> yes. On like New Year's, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day one, like one year, a bunch of blackbirds just fucking fell from the sky. Like you can Google wow. it. Blackbirds, BB, Arkansas. Every time I watch this episode, I'm always like, yeah, starlings can just fucking fall out of the sky, bro. Like, it does happen. It does happen. He he comes off, he's the mayor from Jaws. No, the beach is opening this summer. The beach is open. (laughs) Yeah, sharks are, no, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, no, he's totally the mayor from fucking Jaws. 100%. Yeah, Uh, yeah. They shoot this whole beach sequence handheld, by the way. I didn't, I had Ooh, never I noticed it before, but I noticed it this time. It's, they circle the actors a couple of times, and uh-huh. it is so crazy because it's like it's building up this level of tension and uncomfortability that you don't really acknowledge. It's just there. Mm-hmm. And again, it took me like three watches to finally see that, but I was like, oh, it's because. It's because nothing. They're not on Steadicam at all for this. They're literally just walking around with that camera, and they are circling the 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 people that are speaking several times. And you're like, what? What's next? And where? And why? And how are this? Yeah, is, where am who's, I? <laughs> who's hiding something? Who did this? Right. What's going well, on? And it's interesting too in this scene. Like literally, everyone we know in town is coming into coming down to the beach to see what the hell's going on. Everybody is busy bodying about to see what's happening, you know? So everybody wants to know what's going on at the beach. Why, are, why is the sheriff down there? Why, you know, and he immediately calls Riley's dad to consult him because he's like, this guy's got good sense, you know? Um, but it, yeah, the They're entire also... town comes to the, comes to the beach. Yes, absolutely. Everybody wants to come out and see what's going on. Um, I love like even the, even okay, Aaron and Riley have like their first real conversation. You know, he had the trauma dump on her in episode right. one, but other than that, they have their first interaction here, and it's just genuinely a normal conversation, basically. Mm-hmm. Except that the camera's circling them, and they're on this beach with all these dead cats around, yeah. and the seagulls are in the background, and like the whole thing is just like, and what's about to happen? It's just ratcheting up and ratcheting mm-hmm. up, and then we go to church. It's yep. such a cool, like, again, I love the way that he lays this all out. Yeah, yeah. I will say, I say one of the things that really, that was a little bit of a, uh, for me with this show period, and, and it is, and it just gave, it gave things away for me, was the old age makeup on some of the actors. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, like I, I didn't question it in the beginning. Once we were like two or three episodes in, there's some other things that happen, and you yeah. go, 
ah, uh, that's why everybody's in old age makeup. <laughs> yeah, I was like, they really, really aged some of these actors. Up. Like, <laughs> the actors that I just just watched in like Hill House or something, you know? And so I was like, that's really weird. I know that Elliot from E.T. is not as old as he looks. And the real one that fucks with me is um, is uh, uh, the doctor's Mildred. mom. Mildred. Yeah, Mildred I'm Gunning. like, Mildred? Mildred? Mildred's got a fake-ass face on is what's going on I mean, that actor's like in her she's 20s, so I think. Yeah, maybe she's still, yeah, so she's very young. young. Yeah. I will, that, that's one of the only things that, that was a, a tell for me, too, early on. You know, I mean, the vampire box, of course. I was like, oh, we yeah. fucking vampires. <laughs> and then, and then I, like, really looking at everybody, I was like, they about to de-age these fuckers, I think. Spoiler and I mean, alert. I don't... I really don't know... I really don't know what you would do to get around that. Like you no. now somebody might do CGI instead of prosthetic makeup, but yeah, CGI I mean, would be telling good. there too when they glow and they're too smooth and they look yeah. younger than they're supposed to and I would or look that. older than they're supposed to. Yeah. I hate that anyway. I'd rather, th- I'd rather it be practical makeup and I don't think it would have been an, as noticeable for me if I hadn't just watched some of these actors in some intimately you know? familiar with it, all of the yeah. crew and basically. It, yeah. And it just doesn't seem like necessary, you know? Um, you know, it's it's one of those things. I will say I prefer this where you take younger actors and age them up to start than, you know, the alternative like in The Irishman, for instance. Um, whenever you get an older actor like that, like an actual older it actor, a senior actor, face and you try to make them 30 again. Well, the telling thing to me, though, is their movement. There's a scene in The Irishman, for instance, where Robert De Niro like curb stomps a guy and it looks like a 75 year old man trying to curb stomp someone with a real smooth just, face. <laughs> with what really what kills me is that his back is turned in that scene. I'm like, why not use a body double? Like, just put a 35 year old dude out there. I bet he insisted. He was like, I mean, probably. I've got to curb stomp anybody in a while. I, listen, though, <laughs> I think of. I think of things like, I mean, even Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro played a young Marlon Brando in Godfather Part Two. What if they had just said, let's just put Marlon Brando in different prosthetic makeup than we did to play Vito as an old man? We'll make him right. a young man, you know? Like, we would have been, we would have lost that brilliant performance with, from Robert De Niro. I think this is a problem for Hollywood, honestly, in, in one way or another. I think in this particular case, the story that Mike Flanagan wanted to tell, he did it the right way. It's just something I'm worried about as we move forward, honestly. We're never going to recast any characters, and everybody's just going to get CGI face washed forever. <laughs> um, oh, okay, okay. Our pianist in the church. Ashley, did this person look familiar to you? Did this call any interest to you? We get I, he's highlighted a few times. I noticed him this time, but I, I noticed him more on this watch than I think I have before. All right. My he looks allergy- just I have not been doing cocaine by the way. My I, my allergies are awful. I cannot stop messing with my nose. I'm like I'm, sh- I'm over you, here man. like a cokehead. Kelly God. Kelly has been doing the same. She's been sniffing like that that oh my that other weed. guy. Fucking rad um, weed. Uh okay, so the pianist. <laughs> uh he was super familiar looking to me. I was just like I know you that go- guy. What has he it? been in? I did. I looked him up. I finally looked him up. I asked Kelly first. I'm like, what has this guy been in that we know? And I even described him. Here's what I felt. There was a, there was a show where he was the boyfriend of a major female character. Okay. And the female character was kind of dominant. And this guy played kind of like a milk toast, real calm and laid back, quiet guy who everybody kind of made fun of. And I was thinking maybe he was even like fundamentally fund, fundamentalist Christian in the show mm-hmm. that he had been before. Anyway, that was what I had to work with. And I was like, who is this guy? Here's <laughs> who he is. He's Andrew Grush, who is a okay. member of the Newton Brothers. He's actually oh! playing that organ, Ashley. Fuck, for real? Yeah. Oh, there, Andy Grush. Uh, there okay. he is. I, what he, who he reminded me of, who I thought he was, is an actor named Aaron Arkaway. He was a recurring character on The Sopranos. Tony's sister in The Sopranos is named Janice. Oh my and God. she goes through she goes through an evangelical phase where she finds Jesus. And when she does this, she's dating this guy. She's dating Aaron, dating Aaron Arkaway is the actor's name. Uh, I think in the show his name was Aaron too, actually. But um, he's like a Christian rock singer or former Christian rock singer. Uh-huh. And he's narcoleptic. I don't. If you've watched The Sopranos, you'll probably remember the narcoleptic <laughs> boyfriend. <laughs> But that's him. And he looks so much like Andrew Grush, Grush here. It's frightening. That is like, hilarious. I can't help but think they were like, what does a Christian 
rock star look like, it's this. This is what he looks like, actually. <laughs> That's I'm fairly certain. I'm not the only one that liked Janice's boyfriend. Um, I was that. Uh... I had my I had my headphones in and I was really listening hard this time so I was noticing a little a few things that I hadn't noticed in a while um and and one of the things that I'd noticed was the pianist organ player but I did not yeah. tie him to anything else I was just like huh I don't think I've ever noticed him before <laughs> Uh, so our, our hymn here, we got our first song at this point. Mm -hmm. It's holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. This was honestly, mm. this is one of my favorite ones. Um, I, I like this a whole lot. Uh, it was written by Reginald Heber. Uh, Heber was born in 1783 into a wealthy, educated family. He was a bright youth translating a Latin classic into mm. English verse by the time he was seven. Entered Oxford at 17 and won sure. two awards for his poetry during his time there. After graduation, he became rector of his father's church in the village of Hodnet near Shrewsbury in the west of England, where he remained for 16 years. He was appointed Bishop of Calcutta in 1823. Wow. Uh, most of his 57 hymns, uh, which includes Holy, 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 are still in use today. Lovely. Yeah, there you go. Um, there we go. The, listen, the, the hymns in this show are worth their own thing personally yeah. i cannot Sorry. listen to them alone because they have creepy context to me because i hear them in the show uh, oh, kelly yeah. listens to this soundtrack sometimes just for funsies just when oh, she wants to hear oh. a little classic church music wow <laughs> i mean this would be a good one too for sure because it sounds wonderful but yeah uh, that would be a little too uh too like what horrifying shit's about to happen yeah for me um <laughs> We f we meet Lisa here. Well, we I guess we met her in the first episode for a yeah. second, but we we get another moment here with Lisa, and it's confirmed what was hinted at in the first episode. She's the only one really that comes to daily mass. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. She and uh, and Riley's mom is usually there. As That's well. right. Riley's mom comes yeah. most days. You're right. You're right. So you're um, so you're seeing the people who are who are there and taking sacrament daily which I think is an important point um, for some of the things that are going to shake out and happen as, as the story goes on, you know? Uh, okay. I love that. Like our first real Bev Keen interaction is bitching about the dog. And then our second one is uh, that she is the supply closet Nazi. Yeah. She's a, <laughs> she's, I do not prefer to call women bitches. <laughs> she is a real bitch. If I you mean, want to bitch okay. at me about a bottle of Windex, I swear to God I'll make you drink it. Aaron, Aaron comes to get a bottle of Windex out of the supply closet, and she goes, I find if you put a little water in there and shake it, you can get some more out. Have you tried that? I find and then, that you can and then shame her. in my ass. <laughs> and then she shames her because she threw it away. I yeah. love, though... That when Bev goes to talking about what her mom, you know, your mom would stretch every single bottle here. She mm -hmm. would just use it over and over again until she was spraying nothing but water. Yeah. At home, she never met a bottle she couldn't empty. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> what do you think about yeah. that, Bev? <laughs> Shut your mouth, Bev. You don't know what you're talking about. And also that just goes to show like what someone like that values more than like the, the fucking quality of someone's character. Like, we like we know Aaron's mom was an a, a mean alcoholic, you know, like and and instead Bev wants to talk about why she was so great and frugal. Like that's more important than I mean and let's give Bev the benefit of a doubt for a second and say that she didn't know that she was actually abusive. She damn sure knew that she was an alcoholic though. Yeah, yeah you can uh, come on. So, yeah. yeah. Fuck Bev. Um, Fuck Bev. Fuck you Bev. Boy, and what is Bev doing in the supply closet, Ashley? She's messing oh. with Chekhov's rat poison. Listen here, Chekhov's rat poison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you see this coming eight and a half miles away at least. Yeah, Bev's fucking... That hot dog gets I... dropped by that dog, and I was like, that... See you next Tuesday. I mean, you, and and they put the, they don't even, they don't hide it. This is not like mm -mm. subterfuge or anything. Mm -mm. Like the first episode, she's bitching about the dog. The second episode, she's grabbing rat poison. You're like, oh, she's going to kill then, that dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she do. She do yeah. kill that dog. At, um, the, at the crock pot party. I like too that Aaron passes on. She's like, I'm sprinkling some around my house. I'd be happy to do it for you too. And yeah, Aaron's no, like, I'll be fine, actually. Yeah. Um, 
All right, and then we meet the doctor, Dr. Sarah, and her mother, Mildred Gunning. Mildred. Mm -hmm. These are two of my favorite characters. Yeah, I really, really love the doctor a lot. Okay, so I we talked last week about how there's a lot of, like, Stephen King in this, and it's very, like, Salem's Lot in some ways, and it is. It is also very Dracula, though. And here is our uh, Jack Se- Jack Seward, you know, like she's mm-hmm. she's Doctor yeah. Jack, effectively, somewhat Absolutely. removed from the main human drama. She's not involved in the church's nonsense, right. and yet, even from very early on, she is involved in what is happening to this town. You know, a hundred percent, yeah. Because I mean, she she becomes the figure that's like that. I mean, she's doing the scientific puzzling of it all. You know, like why as these miracles start happening, or as something that's not quite a miracle that's really awful happens, you know, trying to figure out what the fuck is going on with her patients in town, you know, it's Man, very, very good. When, when father Paul is in the pulpit here and he starts giving the, I keep calling them sermons. They're not sermons. Catholics call them homilies. homilies. When, when he's giving his homily here. And this is the Ash Wednesday like, one. Uh, is this the Ash Wednesday one? Yes, yes, because yes, I've got it written down. Uh, they oh, this is the this is before. This is not the Ash Wednesday speech. He gives a little speech at the beginning uh, in the in the first mass when it's just mm. like the daily mass or whatever. But regardless, through through both of these, like how much in love with you? How much in love with Hamish Linklater are you at this point in the show? Like he just seems amazing. He's fantastic. He's fantastic, and I really hadn't seen him in much before this. I me saw neither. Him, I- I remembered him. The only thing I remembered seeing him in was this HBO original movie that was came out in like the early 2000s, maybe. And it was about the um, Iraq war, the first Iraq war and huh. the CNN crew that was there um, oh, wow. and like filming it live. And, and he's in that he plays, he plays a CNN reporter in it. And um, that's the, I was like, cause it was driving me crazy. I was like, I know I recognize him from something. I had to look it up when I first saw this, but that's what I remember him from. And the only thing I'd ever seen him in before, but he's so good in this. He is, he is so heartbreakingly good in this and just, Oh, well, and so clearly in love with these people mm-hmm. and his mission and in a in a way that you can understand why people buy into him, you know, and Absolutely. you want to as well, you know. Um, but there's the comment: Riley walks Aaron home, and then says he's got to, you know, get home for dinner or whatever it is. And she says, mm. uh, it "Reminds me of old times." Fifteen year old Riley sneaking out my window to make curfew. Um, did you ever reconnect with a childhood love like this? No. No. I haven't either. No. I didn't either. I didn't really I didn't, have any worth reconnecting with, I would say. That, I mean, first of all, I think this is this is the one part of the story that is most unbelievable to me, honestly, I think, is that <laughs> both Riley and Aaron, which are fairly uh, amazing human beings, both have terrible circumstances that put them back in their mm-hmm. hometown, you know? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for me, I just never went back. I, well, maybe the there was thing, somebody that yeah, would have. I didn't either. I never went yeah. back to my like I I left at eighteen and I have never lived there again, and <laughs> and I'm quite glad of it. I mean I love my hometown, Fingers but I'm, crossed we ain't going yeah. back, folks. Yeah. No, no, I'm set where I'm at. I'm I'm good. You got to go to a bigger city. <laughs> yeah, um, we're good. We're all set. <laughs> the great song here from Harry Chapin. Saturday morning, Saturday morning, and it's growing light. I look out my window and great remember song. the night. A story is starting and this story ends and I feel like I need you again. Um, Beautiful lyrics throughout. But again, no Neil Diamond. Listen, they tease you with two in the first episode and then they kind of trickle them. There's only a couple more the whole rest. But this from Harry Chapin is a great, it's also, I I, I feel like it's not the same kind of music exactly, but it does feel like a similar piece. And the feeling for this is perfect for that moment in the episode. And again, 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 we get that final line that we hear. Riley lays down in bed as the song's finishing. My love needs a little more time. And we see our girl as he asks, how was your day? How was your day? Um, And then we get the dream again. So we get glimpses this time not only of him in the boat and the church with the bloody walls, we mm-hmm. also get glimpses of the figure on the beach that we saw from episode one, that he was chasing, that he was chasing the, through the storm, something in the hat and the, and the coat. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
Um, and we find we do find out in this episode that the reason Lisa's in a wheelchair is because she was sh- accidentally shot by Joe Colley, um, who is our who is our love our lovable town drunk um, with lovable with town the dog drunk. with the sweet dog. Bless. You know, it's one of those things, man. It's like I, small town tragedies. Nobody but this hundred and twenty seven people even right. know about it. You know, yeah. like I mean, he. I'm sure and Joe had some there. sort of. You know, like that's he's still there. What like that's makes the it thing. all they the worst? They have to see each other every day. They have to like. It's so fucking wild, you know. When it's the same thing, like her coming, um, her coming home to live there, where, where she ran away, where her mother was hateful to her and awful, and she in her house, in her, in her, house, her mother's house, with her mother's old job, like all of that. I would never. I would. I'd find anywhere to go besides that. Anywhere. I mean, it go. does. It does a little bit like smack of like. Oh, is this purgatory? <laughs> Are they all? Yeah. Is this whole island dead already? Actually, <laughs> <laughs> is am I watching Lost? What's happening? <laughs> um, so Mama Flynn realizes here while the song is playing. By the way, she's sewing. Uh, she oh. doesn't need her glasses anymore. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Weird. Ashley, oh. I want Weird. to tell you a funny story. My eyesight corrected itself when I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to Brett one time. He wore glasses as like a kid, and then like. <laughs> One day he just didn't need them anymore. That was me. Exactly. And so I do Magic. need them now. I should, I should wear glasses now. Um, I'm a little bit nearsighted and I've beginning, I'm beginning to get a little bit farsighted as I age mm. too, just ever so slightly. But um, when I was like fourth grade, maybe I got glasses for the first time I needed, I was nearsighted and I needed a prescription lens and I had them from then until college. I got contacts at some point in high school, but when I got to college, lots of people wore glasses. I was a little bit mm-hmm. less worried about like what a typical appearance is. So I got some glasses that I liked and started wearing them instead of contacts. But one day I'm, I'm wandering around campus after class headed to my car. It's raining outside. So I took my glasses off and like tucked them into my sweater and, you and were like, the made it fuck? to I'm, well, I got to my car and I didn't think anything about it, but I got in my car and I started driving and then I realized, like, I don't know, I'd been driving, running errands for like 30 minutes. And I realized I didn't have my glasses on. And I went to grab them, but then I went, wait a minute, why haven't I noticed this? And I'm reading license plates and I'm reading signs. <laughs> and so then it was like a two-week or three-week period where I'm like, well, do I wear these anymore or not? <laughs> What's happening? I went through like a two-week period, a three-week period where I was like, do I wear these things or not? Anyway, I finally gave it up and I never wore glasses after that again. But the joke for years amongst my friends was, did you smoke enough weed that you fixed your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe right that was that. it. I don't know. <laughs> it could um, have been. It's, a, it is a, it's medicinal. <laughs> I didn't meet any priests that had some magical no. uh, sacrament, though. Um, no. But yes. Oh, man. Okay. We have a flying scene here, too, right after that. It's mm-hmm. the first one really in the show, but we do this a few more times. Uh, you and I talked about it when we watched The Lost Boys. Uh, Kelly and I talked about this in when we did our Fright Night discussion, too. Um, there are a ton of movies that have done this. I think oh, they yeah. do a really good version of that, though, where you don't see what it is that's flying, but you get the menace of the flying mm-hmm. while you're yeah, seeing you from their point of view. Yeah, you yeah, know it's not good. Yeah, you know it's not good. Did we get it in the first episode, like, over the over where all the cats were? Briefly, uh, you know what? We might have actually now that I think yeah. about it before. Because I think right that that's kind of like the, when we the see kids the cat were murdered going up at there, the end. Yeah, the teenagers were up there on, you know, like. Uh, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, yeah, they do it really well. You know, shit's about to hit the fan when you see it, too. You're like, Ooh, well, someone's going to get And then hit. it lands in the Miller's house, the empty yeah. house that we saw in episodes yeah. one. So, I mean, okay, we had. Chekhov's uh, rat poison earlier. Now we got Chekhov's empty house here. Empty house, it's been loaded yeah. already in yep. episode two. Yeah, we've um, gotten two two of those treats today. Okay, this is the one. Now we go back to church for the actual uh, Ash Wednesday service, and this yes. is the one actually that I was so impressed by. His homily here is amazing. Okay, yeah. that's a priest that I could listen to once a week. The doors are always open as the gates are always open. That's yeah. a refrain we're going to hear a few times in this show, but like. This message that he's preaching here is so beautiful and so joyful to hear as a person who does try to be a believer, honestly. And there's a there's a mirrored homily later in the show that is mm-hmm. 
very different. And yes, I, it's very wonderful different. how he puts them here yeah. and juxtaposes what happens. Yeah, but it's, like, it is really good writing. And, and yeah. it, I, even for someone who is not religious, I will say that this is what you this is what I would want. This is why this kind of thing is why I've not ever I never found what I was looking for in religion because you don't run across <laughs> that kind of, you know, there are a, a bunch of, of them. There's a lot of hellfire and brimstone in Arkansas, and I'm just not here for it. You know, it's not my thing. And and I'm not, like, I, I don't have time for that shit. Like, that doesn't make me feel good. That doesn't make, like, the, the threat of hell and burning into an eternal hell is, is like a fear of punishment instead of a celebration of choosing to be a good person. You know, like, you, then you're doing right because you don't want damnation instead of doing right because it's just the right fucking thing to do. It's so strange uh, to me. He, he's he got such a wonderful line, and the delivery from Hamish is excellent, too. Do you know what psalms are? They're songs. Songs of worship, songs of praise. It's like, yes, buddy, yes. Like, let's, let's sing. And yes. first of all, I love to be reminded of that, because we don't, anybody who, you know, you think of a Bible thumper, the whole book of Psalms, and we quote it a lot, but we don't think about the fact that they are all so they're meant to be sung. Those were yeah. not poetry; they were songs. They were well, songs to the Lord. The crazy shit about that is that there are branches of religion that don't that are anti music. Don't have music. Yep. Yep. Nope. The, the uh, fuck? Can't can't follow you there. I'm sorry. Oh my god. Yeah. No. Um. Okay, I love how Mama grabs Riley here. Riley's going to sit back again. Mm -hmm. And she says, no, 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 Riley. It's not a sacrament. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Yeah. And she's right. It is. It's very different. Ash Wednesday is for anyone. And I think any church goes for this, too. If you show up, they'll put the ashes on your head. Yeah. And they will tell you, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So if you don't know, the deal with Ash Wednesday is every year, right before Easter, there's Palm Sunday. The Sunday before Easter, one week before, commemorates the uh, time when Jesus and his disciples first came into Jerusalem, the week before he is crucified. And uh, the, the Bible tells us that he was like praised by the crowds and they fawned over him and they literally waved palm fronds and then laid them down in front of him for his donkey to pass over with him on the back, right? So the idea is that we have Palm Sunday, the week before Easter, and then we take those palms, we burn them, we dry them and burn them, and then the ashes from those palms are used to make the ash that they rub on your head the next Ash Wednesday. That's year-old palm fronds that you're getting on your forehead when you go to Ash Wednesday service. That's the way they're supposed Dang. to do it anyway. Yeah. Dang, that's um, authentic. That's your authentic I know, ashes. Right? I know, I know. Uh, but it is, okay, so this remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. That's a real thing that they say when mm -hmm. the priest puts your, and generally if they, they say your name as well, Joel Sharpton, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. Um, it reminds me so much. And I'm sure there's some historical like, you know, mirroring or something to what you would say or what the attendant would say to you when you approach the emperor. Uh, remember thou art mortal. Remember thou art mortal, <laughs> mortal, right? Like all of this is, I think genuinely, I think there is a part of religion that is about coming to terms with our own finite nature, right? Like mm -hmm. we are here for just a blink of, of the eye and whether you believe there's anything after that or not, that makes our time here precious. Absolutely. Even if there is an afterlife, this is unique. And so we have to savor it and hold on to it in the whole nine yards. But like, I, I, I anyway, I, I think this is lovely. And I love <laughs> Riley's like look of dishevelment and misunderstanding <laughs> and like, what am I even supposed to do? I mean, right. he says amen at one point, right? Like after he says to dust, you shall return. Amen, that just would I truly guess. be me <laughs> being forced to get ashes by, by my mom. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's very awkward for me. <laughs> so, and then we let everybody out and we all go to the crock pot, uh, the crock pot luck, which crock is a great luck. title, by the way, because they call the Island, the crock pot. It's, it's Crockett Island. Uh, somebody had come up with the crock pot a long time ago. They're all this like melting pot of people that come yeah, from all over and whatever. They're pretending they're a melting pot. <laughs> yeah. So they're all a very white melting pot. And they've all right. got the same sort of like Eurocentric accent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it um, is a, it's a lovely little like a little gathering of, of the community. We've got a band playing Dave Matthews and 
Okay, so they do play Dave Matthews at some point, but the first song that is really, you can hear any lyrics from, mm -hmm. and I had to look this up because I was like, I know this. Where do I know this from? It's called Democracy. It's by Leonard Cohen. It's a Leonard Cohen song. Oh! Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's coming through a hole one. in the air from those nights in Tiananmen Square. It's coming from the feel that this ain't exactly real, or it's real, but it ain't exactly there. Uh, democracy is coming to the USA. That's, that's the lyric there. Um, really good song, really interesting song in that. I mean, if you know anything about Leonard Cohen, you know, it's probably not a happy bubbly song about right. wonderful life <laughs> right. in the amazing USA. Right. Um, th it's an interesting this, choice. this song is, it's one of those like born in the USA that if you just listen, but not really listen, you might think, oh, that's wonderful. No, this song is like, this is digging into that rotten town that we were yeah. talking about in episode one, that, yeah. you know, that, that city in decline or whatever. Um, it, very interesting choice here. And again, yeah. like, it would be weird for the actual cover band at the party to sing this song, probably, <laughs> but good for the TV show. Right, right. Good choice. Good choice. It's, it, yeah, it's probably not really the, the, a great party, a par great party tune, <laughs> but they play oh, it in a very okay. groovy way. They do. Here's my favorite line, though. Okay, it's, it, this is a lyric in the song. It's coming from the sorrow in the street, the holy places where the races meet, from mm. the homicidal bitchin' that goes down in every kitchen to determine who will serve and who will eat. That's a fucking lyric. Jesus. Ash, Leonard Cohen write a song, y'all. I don't know if y'all know that. Mm. Um Okay, Damn. Oh, oh, this is about the time, by the way, that we meet. So Sarah Gunning, our doctor that we talked about earlier, yes. she's in the crowd at the Crock-Pot Luck with a friend. Yes, My kind friend. of second date is what she says. Yes. So first of all, we're, we know that she's same-sex attracted here. Uh, she's a lesbian. But also, she's trying to make a life work, Ashley, yeah. even though she's stuck here on the island with her mom in her yeah. final years. Well, yeah, and she, I mean, she even admits that she doesn't know how to leave. You know, like... Yeah. She doesn't, it's, it's like too, it feels too late to move her mom off the island. It feels too hard and too complicated. You know, and I think in her mind, once her mom dies, she has the opportunity for an entirely new and different life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, <laughs> and it, it's one of those things that happens sometimes for, and honestly, we're at that stage in our own lives. Now, my mother is not, my mother's in great health and will be for 40 years, probably, I'm sure. But right. There is that moment where you can get caught up in the almost looking forward to the death of a parent because it's like they're not having a great quality of life. They're impacting my quality of life to such a degree. Like who's winning out of this, honestly? Right. Like who's benefiting from this, uh, you know, con continued um, suffering? Ugh. Anyway, yeah. it's a weird yeah. situation well, and, to be in. And being a caretaker is such is such a, a like a an all-encompassing thing you know it becomes every bit of your personality it becomes every bit of your life it's what you do and then i think when you lose the person that you've been taking care of there is like this like loss of center and loss of self and like it really is an exploration to figure out who you are um without having to be that caretaker without that that burden without that you know that job title basically you know it's it's a whole thing to to like unpack how how you want to go forward and learn to live for yourself instead of living living to care for someone else uh sarah says she catches or the the girlfriend actually catches father paul staring at sarah oh, yeah and sarah says um you know, he would stare at me. The, oh, she's talking about Monsignor Pruitt, the old uh, past, the old priest that was there. She said he would stare at me just like that all the time. I remember it freaked me out thinking he knows, meaning he knows that I'm gay, um, which is hilarious. I love yeah. the idea that like priests can see through into your inner soul and see I the mean, sin you're how many, or whatever. How many young gays have felt that in church? I can't <laughs> he even knows. imagine. Jesus He's talking Lord. about me. My God. I will say personally when i was like 11 and 12 i absolutely thought the pastor was talking about my own masturbation or whatever it might be in the middle of his sermon he's talking about me he knows <laughs> he knows he knows oh my um, god oh man great gordon lightfoot song here if you could read my mind uh okay so this is off the album sit down young stranger from 1970 um let's see if it charted 
Oh, Hockey Night in Canada used this song for their year-end playoff montage commemorating <laughs> the Vegas Golden Knights Stanley Cup win uh, in, in 2023 after uh, Gordon Lightfoot passed. So Gordon wrote this song about his divorce, he said. Uh, he said this lyrics came to him as he was sitting in a vacant Toronto house one summer. The song compares events in his relationship to a ghost movie and a paperback romance novel. The lyrics include, I don't know where we went wrong, but the feeling's gone and I just can't get it back. Um, really good song here. All the songs are great, honestly. Yeah, yeah. This is a hell of a soundtrack. Uh, so Aaron and Riley don't use their drink tickets for different reasons. That's a very funny scene. That's a very funny funny. scene. And I think it really shows that you know these two reconnecting, but they already they feel like they already know each other so well. Like they have that shared history. It doesn't feel like it. I I think it, it comes across very genuinely that they're old friends reconnecting. Uh, and then Pike is murdered. Yeah. I mean, and that's so no, clearly awful. what it is. We know that obviously, but I mean, even some members of the, the crowd. Hot dog. Yes. Aaron sees it and knows what, what has happened too. She can't like, mm. she doesn't have proof to accuse her out loud. Right. And again, it goes back to what we said in episode one, where nobody wants a confrontation. Nobody no. wants to have a fight With unless you're a Bev Keen. And then you don't mind having yeah. a fight. Right. So it's yeah. like, when one party is willing to do anything and the other party wants things to go well, the crazy party is going to win. Like yeah. you... now, every damn time, every damn time they're going to get what they want because they <sighs> either make it happen or push for it to happen. And she makes this happen. It's awful. So really uh, like, that's a tough scene to watch. I, I mean, I already said that I definitely you just skip, skip it. it. I, I, I can't watch it. This is, that's something that they do. I think they do a really, that, that horrified me. Like, and I mean, <laughs> I'm a y'all. We're, we watch people get eaten all the time, you know. But like, what is it about a dog? It fucking upset me. Upset me. And I mean, you see it coming, so at least you could mentally prepare yourself for it. But yeah, I don't. I skip it. I can't watch it. But it is uh, because in my mind, it's so well done and horrifying. Right. Right. And so as many times so as I Joe, watch this, I could not watch that dog die a dozen times. That would be awful. Uh, Joe Colley, they so say, Oh, Joe, if it was, it was an accident and Joe tries to scoff at the word accident and then he yeah. sees Lisa. So you mentioned mm-hmm. it earlier. He, he shot Lisa in a drunken stupor. Mm-hmm. It's called a hunting accident, but Riley mentions it earlier. Like there's not a lot of he big just gets game drunk on and this shoots damn his island. Gun. That's yeah. he gets drunk and shoots his gun. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Um, we all know that fucking guy in a small town that gets drunk and shoots his gun, you know, like that's a guy that, that lives in that town for sure. You know? Well, and it's crazy because it, he realizes he has no, like he has, he doesn't have enough standing in the community to cause this to be an issue right here. Like he can't stand his ground right. and say, no, someone hurt my dog. It's, right. It, he has to basically, he retreat. knows his place. He knows yes. his place, you know, like he, yeah. you know, and what's really great though is about, about this is that the sheriff doesn't treat him that way. The sheriff like goes and talks to him about it and the sheriff goes and talks to Bev about it, you know, like, and we have that confrontation a little bit later. Um, but yeah, he doesn't have, he doesn't have any, no one cares about him in this town, you know? Uh, yes. hundred percent. All right. I'm trying to find our next him here. I thought I had it and now it's giving me two different links yeah okay so the i thought the name of the song was lead thou me on it's not the name of the song is lead kindly light Uh, blessed john henry newman is the author on this one he was beatified by pope benedict the 16th uh this is from september 19th of 1920 um uh no September, no, excuse me, September 19th, 2010 was when he was beatified. Excuse me. Uh, He was born in 1801. He wrote this in 1834. Lead kindly light amid encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. Um, Boy, that line right there is exactly the problem here. And you mm-hmm. hear this sometimes. People really talk like this sometimes. Well, yes, we had to do some terrible things, but right. our goal was so good. That will all make sense when you see what we accomplish. Yeah, no, the end goal. How you do it matters, matters. too. Matters. Jesus, yes. How you get there matters, people. Yeah, yeah 100%. Absolutely. Um, 
I love the moment when Riley gets up and goes with him in the morning. And the dad tries to meet him, right? He's like, you need some shoes. Let me go yeah. get you some shoes. And he doesn't know how to say, I love you. Yeah. Thank you for getting up. I want to make this coming better. With us. Yeah. He doesn't know how to say any of that. He doesn't mm -hmm. have the language, the emotional language to say any of that. So what no. he does is, I'm going to run get you shoes. I'm going to yeah. get you some good boots today. And we yeah. go out there on, on the boat and we do the thing. Um, and Riley tries to, at one point, tries to like take care of him and, 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 and tries to take... Uh, uh, a, uh, a a a trap from it. The, you know? Yeah, the trap. Yeah, yes. The, yeah, and and he's like, "You're back," and he's like, "Oh, it's, it's actually okay," which is another it's, little. It's okay. It's okay, son. It feels yeah. it feels okay today. You know, like that's another little. Um, um, check that. Pay attention to that. Well, okay, and this is the first time here that we see Mama Flynn going to daily mass. We don't see her in the earlier scene, but we see her here. She's going to say thank you for that returned eyesight. <laughs> Right. Dad's back's doing a little better, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, we got, we got things to, little, we've got a praise report. My God. Just a little praise report. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. And this is when the sheriff comes to talk to Bev, comes to talk to Bev. He, he finds her in the, the supply closet, <laughs> by the way, her, the way that she turns around and is like, surely your job didn't bring you here. Are one of these children responsible oh. for some terrible thing on the island? You know, whatever. Like, immediately putting it off on somebody else. On a fucking but kid. Then, like, oh, a child must have done something awful. She's even when, even when he talks her through it to try to make her understand, like, of course I'm coming to talk to you, Bev. You were talking right. about a poison, like, just the other day to kill all the rats, remember? And the dog's been poisoned, Bev. Like, and we know still, it. he talks around it, again, because he doesn't want the confrontation. He's trying Are to be you polite. Saying are you saying that this dog might have been accidentally poisoned by the poison I put out to hopefully poison whatever killed the kittens? My she God, says, if that's what you're saying, I could never live with myself. If that's what's occurred, if you're certain, I don't think I'll ever forgive myself. Mm, what a bitch. So, is it? And is, are you? Are you? <laughs> certain? Mm. The, I'm like... She might as well have come out and said, you'll never take me alive, copper. Yeah. Like, you can't prove it. You can't prove I killed that bitch. dog. Such a bitch. Such a bitch. And in fact, I'm going to give you an, an accidental way the dog could have gotten into the poison. Right. You oh, have access her. to this closet her. as well, Sheriff. Everyone does. We should put a <laughs> lock on it. We should lock it up. That's what we should do. Oh, Bev. Okay, we we see Bowl here, who we met in the first episode, selling yes. weed to the kids. Yeah. He's, but we find out, I, I love, we only really get like two scenes with Bowl. Right. He's such a good dude, though. And yeah, you get he that is. immediate. First of all, he look, doesn't want to sell the kids drugs, but look, he knows somebody's going to sell them something. And also, he can get weed real weed to get it to the kids, weed. right? You just well, sell yeah. a little bit of weed. But that's what I'm saying. It's like someone is going to fill this hole. These yeah. kids are going to get it from somewhere and they're going to get shit from somebody who's trying to hurt them or doesn't care if they get hurt. I'll at least give them the real thing and won't give them anything harder. Right. And he so like he's controlling the flow. Like, yeah, Bull he's, a, he's seems, just a like kid he himself. He doesn't seem that much older than, than, you know, our, our teenagers. He doesn't seem much older yes. than them. Uh, but he's here. He's helping Joe Collie. He's, he's, right. it turns out he's the one that brings Joe his like propane for his generator tank mm. and like fixes up his machinery and whatever falls apart. He helps him keep things running. Uh, yeah. the sheriff says, if I check your, uh, if I check your pockets <laughs> bowl, will all I find be air filters? And he goes, if you try to search my pockets, you'll probably just find a fist in your ass. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And then Joe Colley's like, no, he's, this is an asshole and he doesn't, he thinks he's funny and he doesn't realize shut it's your fucking mouth. Fault. It's not his fault. He was born woefully unfunny. <laughs> oh, so such a great line. I love that actor too. The guy playing Joe Colley is so fantastic. He is so good in Hill house as well. He's just, this man can act his balls off. He says, uh, did you ask Bev? About mm -hmm. the dog, and he goes, "Yeah, she insists she didn't have anything to do with it." And Joe goes, "Oh, she insists." <laughs> oh, she insists. Yeah, yeah. Like he's. Um, I mean, he know. I mean, we know. We all know. But Fucking see, bitch. okay. Well, let's talk about like. And again, I don't like. Maybe there is pretentiousness here that you and I are are overlooking because we do enjoy the content so much. But I think this is an example of how, like, uh, uh, Flanagan is genuinely doing a great job of like efficiency like this scene mm -hmm. 
we Kali is not a bad guy. He's a guy right. whose his life has fallen apart, and his demons have won too many times in his life. But Kali's just a guy trying to get by, and he wants to be neighborly with all these people. Yeah. And the sheriff here is genuinely a public servant. Like no and matter what's going on his in his personal life, job. That's and understands Joe's right, even if he can't prove it, and right. is trying to make that work. You know? Well, and just because Joe is an alcoholic, just because Joe should maybe be in jail, I don't know. But just because Joe is those things does not mean that Joe deserves any less than what everyone in town should get, you know? Like, it's just, it's one of those things. Like, just because you have an, just because you're an addict does not mean you're not worthy of uh, a place to live, a community of, you know, what whatever, you know, your basic fucking needs, you know, you are worthy. Addiction does not define you, does not define who you are, you know, especially if you are making an effort, like we see later to, you know, rectify some of your wrongs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like it's not, and I think that's, that's not a message that this show says out loud that, that loudly, that clearly, but it's, but it is one that's there. It's like, nobody's too late for redemption. Right. right? No. Like, like everybody can, I mean, you, might not ever pay for the things that you've done, right? Like Riley will never fix that girl's life no. or her family's life, but Riley could and can change his life now to impact the universe for positive. Right? And, he can and come so home can Joe Colley. And yes. he can enrich his mother's life and he can help his father and he can, he can help those that are around him and that he loves. You can make an impact in your very small circle. You know, even if that's, <laughs> Even if that's the amends you make, then fucking it's worth it. It's worth it to your family. You know what I mean? As someone who who has dealt with, you know, familial addiction, it is worth it to your family to make to even if that's all you all you achieve, you know, is that is making those things right. It's worth it, you know? Man, please, Lord, don't ever let me have to go to a one on one AA meeting. Oh my God. <laughs> The, how do, and I, I'm how do we start this? acknowledges it. How, and like <laughs> yeah. how awkward. Like I did not think about how awkward this would be. But he makes a good point too when he pitches it to Riley. You know, like he's like, you know, just because you're the only one that's going to be there right now doesn't mean you're the only one that needs this in town, you know? And, you know, he references Joe Colley. And, and, and if you've got one drinker in town, you probably have more than one, you know, even in a, even in a town that small. So like, he, like he's very right that this is, this is again, somebody the priest who is doing his job to serve his community and offer something that could be helpful to a member of his, you know, a congregant. Yeah, man. It reminds me of, did did you watch the West wing? Oh God. Yes. You know, it's, it, it turns out there's like yes. a secret tiny West wing, uh, oh, AA, yeah, meeting, AA meeting, yeah, like yeah. a handful of senators and the vice president or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, but, but like, you do, I do feel for, there are people in Riley's position where like, I'm in an isolated environment or it's a tiny population. And then there are people in like those West Wing folks thing where it's like, hey, we're too high profile to let people right. know that we're alcoholics or are right. actively suffering and being treated alcoholics or whatever, you know. Well, so. and like, and when you're talking about AA, like anonymity is, is a piece of it. You know, it's everyone, you use first names, you don't use last names. You know, you might use a last initial to reference someone. Um, and community is such a huge piece of that. You know, like we have a really thriving AA community here in, in my city, a huge foundation that kind of over runs it and oversees it. And there are meetings all over town, all of the time, any time of day. And like, I mean, it is a, an incredibly supportive community and, and it is like known, like even like I'm not, I'm not an alcoholic. However, I, I could recommend specific meetings to someone because of, of who I know and what I've heard, you know, from, awesome. from people that are a part of it, you know? So it is, um, I think that this is a really cool thing for them to take the time to show and, and, and for us to see and get a, a kind of a glimpse into. And then, you know, you're vulnerable in those meetings anyway. And, and to be one-on-one -on -one with someone is even more, you know, like you're really, really putting yourself out there. Uh, a couple of things come out in this, in this AA meeting though, right. Ashley, you mentioned it last episode about the settlement after the oil spill yes. that the town took, but we get some details on that here. Riley lays it out obviously in the most negative crass way, but right. the priest doesn't argue with any of the facts. No. 
And it's so nice to hear was, someone talk some blatant shit about Bev Keen. Thank you. Yeah, well, and not just Bev, but he gives the church shit here too, because right. Bev was effectively in charge of the church because Monsignor Pruitt was so scatterbrained and, yeah. and you know, old and demented. Um, okay. So what happened was the, the oil spill happens. The oil company has to, or, or offers a settlement to people so that they don't get like a, a class action lawsuit. Right. And the settlement is a couple of hundred thousand, maybe for most family members right. um, or for most, for most of the families. And it sounds like a big chunk of money, but as Riley lays out, it's nothing in comparison to several years of, of, of no wages or lowered wages. Right. right. And the big thing that comes out here is that Bev was integral in talking people into taking it. She said, yeah. take the money. It's a blessing. Take the money. It's a blessing take from the God. Take the money and then bless While you're the taking church. It. Send Turn some round. back as a thank you to God. Yeah. Tie so, that shit. Tie that, tie that, tie that. So she ends up with a big pile of money that she's in charge of. And the implication is heavy here. Joe Colley says it somewhere similar as well. Right. The implication is that Bev ended up with most of that money personally. Absolutely. I wonder about that because like, first of all, she doesn't seem to enjoy any sort anything of anything materialistic. Yeah. It's not, she's not a materialistic person. It doesn't seem like, I don't but also she, enjoys she never left the Island. Yeah, yeah so that's what. So I, I think genuinely, she just took the pile of money that she got and built this building. Now yeah, the spent usefulness way too of the much building, on it probably. You know, yes, like that's the thing. The usefulness of this rec center in the middle of this island, where you've got like a failing church and no right. industry and, and whatever. People like, that live there. Come yeah, on. What is the rec center even for? The 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 sheriff makes a joke. Bev, I don't think it matters how many people you can fit in there. Right. Um, twice the people doesn't really matter. But Riley puts it such a fine point on it. Churches. Like fat, plump little ticks sucking them dry. Mm -hmm. And listen, it is hard to argue with him when you look around at towns like I talked to you about my hometown last week. That town is full of churches, though, Ashley. Mm -hmm. A lot of they them are. really nice buildings. Really beautiful buildings. And their coffers are full, I can assure you. Churches A lot of them are. This, oh, man. Churches around this country are run like businesses. And it is bizarre to me to have to have that much money involved in something that's supposed to be about uh the soul and this like it's just strange to me it's very strange to me that's something i could never understand i can never understand asking a family to tithe when they don't have the money to tithe when they are barely scraping by when they're barely barely making it and they still feel that obligation and will tithe to the detriment of their children you know it's I mean, it's hard for me. There's, there. I struggle. It, many normal churches, I think, are guilty of a language and an attitude that fosters that in their congregants. But I think there are, you know, the 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 classic televangelist is just fucking oh. open and brazen about the way that they do give, it. Give, give, give. First give. fruits. It's this idea of you have to give God the first fruits. That first money goes to God, mm. and then He can bless you. By returning it and doubling it for you, right? But that prosperity gospel is, is, first of all, it's not biblical. It's not true. It is not beneficial. It is ruinous to people. And that's it not is. what Father Paul is preaching here. No. But that is sort of what Bev is buying. A hundred percent. Look, God is not your bookie. Nope. You ain't going to make money off God. He's not your stockbroker. Mm -mm. The only way you're going to no. make money off God is if you are a false prophet. Boy, that's it. That is it right there. Um, Boom. They also, I love it because Riley goes further. Now he's like, let's, let's talk he's about the problem up. of he's pain. Like, mm -hmm. Let's talk about the problem of suffering, pastor. And the priest is very, he's like, hey, suffering can be a gift. And Riley calls him out on that too. What a monstrous idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the idea that Listen, this, God, this God could save, could, could prevent poverty. Save one and, and children are suffering and, and this God could change that and he's not. What kind of God do you have? The only time in the last four years or so that I've cursed at anyone religious was over a meme over the former president's assassination attempt. Oh. <laughs> and it was after he got shot at, I saw this image, this a person I knew shared with Jesus, a ghostly Jesus figure behind the pre the former president, I saw flicking that. away the bullet out from right in front of of President Trump, former President Trump, and y'all, I said, if you have a Jesus who would save President Trump from that bullet, 
but not save the hundreds now of school-age children who have taken bullets and died. Thank not you. only would I not worship that Jesus, I would, I would lead the cause against him against in rebellion yeah. to tear down heaven. Like if yeah. that's if that's what you're worshiping, go ahead and sign me up as a Satanist. First of all, I don't think any of that is true. That is not what God is. That is not the way that the universe works. And if you believe in a theology that's telling you that that He chooses one over another in the moment, that is so evil and what it leads to is exactly what happens in this town mm -hmm. as people begin to justify action after action after action and it's a it is a it's it is God's literally will. the definition of a slippery slippery slope y'all mm -hmm. yeah it, yes we can go from dog poison into genocide in the oh, blink of an eye a hundred yeah yeah and half <laughs> and half in the name of religion i mean it's yeah. happened so many times <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, I, all right. We've gone a long time. I was have. ranting on this episode, honestly. I do want to wrap up with two things real quick. We see a face at the... Well, we don't see it. We hear the report from Mildred of the face at the window, which I, I will say, like, kudos to Mike Flanagan for keeping himself from giving us the Salem's lot pasty face in the window, oh, yeah, which yeah. I know he wanted to do. Like I'm that's sure such a classic image, but you can't, you, know? because you can't give all, you can't give it all away. You know, it would give no. things away that we don't want to see yet. And, but she says, I saw your father. She thinks she sees her, her, her Sarah's father. I saw your father, which yeah. again, it's interesting because we, we, you know, Riley was certain who he had seen yeah, wandering absolutely. around on the beach. He was certain Mon Monsignor seen Pruitt. Monsignor, she's certain she saw Riley. I mean, she's certain she saw Sarah's father. Um, so interesting. Yeah. And well, and we've got Aaron on the toilet. Again, somebody <laughs> said in our, somebody said in a comment, we're talking about this in our Facebook group about, does no one close their fucking windows in this house and this like nobody closes their drapes in this town that like, was Aaron's derek derek pissing. george said yeah, derek, derek lord george. said that derek derek uh, aaron's pissing with her fucking like curtains wide open <laughs> y'all i don't ever have my curtains up like every now and again kelly will open we have a we have like a storm door and then like a regular door um you know so the storm door is is clear obviously and we kelly even has put like this like um like a prism sort of thing covering over the window. So yeah, when the like light a comes through, you get a cool, kind of thing. yes, but you also get a cool, like rainbow thing going on. Anyway, I'll, anytime I walk through the living room and those, and the door is open and the, you can see the, I try to close it because I'm like, no, the dog barks when the car goes by. I'm like, no, I don't want anything. <laughs> like, don't close the windows. Why is the door yeah. open? I'm, I want privacy. Thank you very much. I'm inside. <laughs> um, okay. But Aaron though, while she's peeing, she notices some spotting. And she makes yes. a rush to the doctor at midnight for a visit. Everything's Absolutely. fine, but, a, but already again, we're like, I mean, and I, a, a big part of this season, I think we're going to have to talk about, um, you know, pregnancy and, and some of the issues that come along with that. Some of the fears that come along with that. Like, man, yeah. I don't know if you know this, Ashley, but the, the female body is a pretty terrifying uh, place. Oh, <laughs> tell me more about that, Joel. <laughs> But I mean, there's just so much. There's yeah. so much to always worry about. In this moment, like you yeah. feel for, I I used to joke. And this is her first um, pregnancy. Like she doesn't know. Yes. And she's even apologetic. She's like, I, I'm so sorry I woke you up in the middle of the night. And and Sarah's like, no, if you, imagine if you hadn't and something had been wrong and you, how we, we would both, both feel, feel terrible. We both feel shitty. So I'm glad yeah. you came by. That's what I'm here for. I, I've, I've told Kelly so many times, I felt this way with her when she was pregnant with the twins. I felt this way with my, my first wife when she was pregnant with both of our sons. But it's like, as, as the man in the relationship, as the partner, I just felt so useless. Like, all I can do is not kick you in the stomach for nine months, I guess. Yeah. Like, don't I mean, throw you down a flight of stairs. And, and that's the best <laughs> well, that I can do to help. To be honest, uh, murder is the leading cause of death among pregnant women. So, it, you know, just try not to kill I, your wife. I think you're doing pretty good right? there. Yikes, y'all. But it is it is terrible though because you yeah, there's, there's not nothing much you, you can, can do you're not in control to anything. help it. Yeah. yeah all yeah, you yeah. can do is hurt it. All you can do is do things that could hurt your pregnancy, basically. It's really unless really you're just bringing up. snacks and soft blankets. <laughs> yeah. Um okay, and then we get to well, I should mention quickly, Bowl's disappearance. There's some yeah. a neat interact Bowl is passing the empty house where this we saw the really something cool land. And creepy. I loved the scene. Uh, they do a th cool thing that I, I loved from the predator. Uh, one of the things that the predator does is it will 
record you know you saying something and then basically play it back to you in some way yeah and we get this here bowl's like somebody there and then he hears his own voice somebody there you know uh very very cool moment creepy i love it and then he's snatched into the house the door closes but the other thing that i love is his his uh lunchbox like rolls away from him by the by the fence it's uh-huh. a cool little moment there because the camera kind of lingers on the lunchbox left all alone. And you think mm. somebody would have noticed that, right? But I got news for you. Nobody's going to notice nope. that, that that lunchbox is there or that bowl went missing, honestly. Nope. That is, that is not Chekhov's lunchbox. <laughs> You're right. We finish our episode at the second Sunday of Lent. So, so Lent starts at Ash Wednesday. And then we get, well, I say it's the second Sunday. That's not true. It's the first Sunday, actually, of Lent. Uh, but Father Paul is back in the pulpit and ready for some miracles this Sunday morning. Yep, this is it. This is this is it. He's ready to he's ready to 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 show some show, show people some shit. This is one of the things that I really wanted to was excited to talk about. This moment, first of all, it's lovely in the episode the way that it yeah. all plays out, and you it is, can't help well, but get really- it tense too it's like because they're like what the fuck are you doing man this is hateful this is like what she can't walk to you like everyone's really shocked and really off put by the whole thing at first which dad yeah. especially right calling yeah. him out yeah don't do that what are you yeah. and he finally at first he's just like what father what are you and then he's very he's angry yeah. honestly yeah and i love that i love that reaction because the what they could have made this it already has that feeling, but, but given the congregation, a different reaction to that moment, they could have made this a faith healing thing, right? Yeah. Oh you know? yeah. And it, and it doesn't, well, I mean, it does, but it doesn't, you know, it's not like yes. he's the one that healed her. It's not like, you know, that, that kind of charlatan of a, of a, of a, you know, traveling, <laughs> traveling well, religious man that heals the, the people, you know, it's so, it's so interesting because there is some of that from congregants, but mm-hmm. not from Father. You never yeah. hear it from Father Paul. No. Father Paul is not there talking about I'm the miracle. I did it. Yeah. He is the he is the messenger for the miracle. He's yeah, got the delivery Bev, system. Even Bev, like in the next episode, or I think it's in the next episode, is like that's not how any of this works. You know, when they're like, can you can you t- can you talk to my husband? Can you help my my brother? Can you help my my friend? She's like, that's not how this works. You know. But you know there. There is a history of religious leaders, especially, or religious organizations and congregants holding people to account that are disabled or are, are permanently injured, like, like mm-hmm. Lisa is, that their healing or lack thereof is a product of their lack of faith. Their lack of you faith. You don't love yeah. Jesus enough. Mm, you yeah. don't believe. You didn't You're come not- to church often enough. Yeah, your faith isn't strong enough. You yeah. you didn't tithe enough, you didn't Ashley, tithe like enough. we were talking earlier. <gasps> yep. You didn't tithe enough. Oh, yep. Lord. Yep. Uh, so it's. I'm glad that there's not any of that there. But that's what, honestly, that's what Dad's reacting to so negatively. Right. What are you doing? Because they don't know Father Paul that well at no, this moment. They no, all love he's... the new priest. Yeah, They're excited he's about him. But, you know. But they don't have a relationship with mm-hmm. him. No, they don't. I mean, they don't know him like that. And he doesn't know them like that. Like, what the hell are you doing? You know, like it is, what? it's very, very tense when that starts. And, and he's just very insistent and very calm the whole time. It's, um, it's such an, it's such an interesting scene. And she decides, I mean, she's like, well, fuck, maybe I can stand up. But she, you could see when she's like, puts her hands on the, on the arms of that chair and pushes up. And it's like, here we go. Here We're off to the races now. This is, shit's getting crazy man and and you you think about the restoration of that we don't we, it's not clear how young she was when the accident took place right, right right um but you get the feeling that she remembers walking yeah oh for sure like i feel like it's yes. been within the past like maybe like th- three five years like it hasn't that, i you feel know, like, like i feel like at most lisa was nine or ten yeah 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 and maybe older than that even and so now she's a young teenager and it's and it's like the restoration of that when mm-hmm. you have finally cuz it does feel like she's made like Lisa is not a negative person she no. she has a moment where she responds negatively to seeing Joe Colley at one point she's walking with the father i think that's in right. episode 1 
and they they have a negative interact. Both of them are sort of sad to uh, see the other one being mm-hmm. there, right? Super awkward. But in general, Lisa has such a positive outlook on life. She doesn't seem to be someone who's sad for her circumstances, no. even though they are tragic. And yet, you get a glimpse of the other side, and you can see it on her face. The restoration oh. of everything that she had lost. Yeah. And the realization of her future lying before her now yeah. is really powerful. All the things that she's not gotten to do with, with her friends. She's not gotten to, you know, ride fucking ride bikes with the guys when they were going off to the to the uppers, you know. And she joked about, oh, I, I'm fine. I don't want to smell like cat shit anyway. But she does want to smell like cat shit, you know. Like, a you do. Bit. Like, you, there's bit. part of you that wants to be in that and be part of it. So, yeah, it is. It's this moment of, like, of, like a, a flash of, like, life in her eyes that's a little different than what you've seen in, in her character before. You know, it's so funny, by the way, Ashley, I didn't even think, I didn't even realize that in episode one, when she when she makes that comment, she says, they're going to smoke weed in the uppers. And she says, no, thanks. I'd rather not smell like cat shit. And in my mind, I was like, oh, that's a sly comment on how terrible weed smoke smells. Oh, how, bad, how bad their weed is. <laughs> but actually, there are cats up there <laughs> and one of them shit. sat in shit. Yes. One of them, one of them says, oh, yeah. I, I laid in cat shit. Accident. Yeah. Which I, yes. She probably wasn't talking about how bad weed smelled. I didn't even think about that. Anyway, um. Yes, I love this moment for Lisa, and I love this moment for her parents. Like, once they realize she's up, the rapture that goes over their face, there are, we've talked several times about how people convince themselves that they're on the side of God, or God's mm-hmm. on their side, and then they and then they do terrible things. This is one of those moments where you see how somebody could get convinced. You right, know? well, she, and she's been doing the right thing. She's been going to church every day. She's been taking the sacrament. She's been, she's been singing the hymnals. She's been faithful. She's done confession. She's done all the things she's supposed to do. She's the faithful servant of the Lord who has been rewarded yeah. for her faith, you know, and that is, and that's going to feed into everything that happens, you know, in the next few episodes. You know, I've, I've never, I've never seen someone who's paralyzed rise up out of their wheelchair but but i have seen i have seen personally what felt like miraculous healing you know somebody who literally the doctors told everybody bring the family members in from out of town to say goodbye because it's over and then they go on to live for years and years and years to come after that right or or somebody being a tragic one of my best friends growing up had a a a a four-wheeler overturn on him oh jesus you know riding out in the woods and it it punctured his lung, collapsed one of his lungs, like it was a whole ordeal. Maybe he wasn't going to make it. This kid was like 13, 14 at yeah. the time, maybe. Man. Oof. And again, miraculous recovery. He's, fine. He's a preacher now. Matter of fact, now that I think oh. about it. So like you, if you had that sort of thing, and again, it doesn't have to be to this level, but if you have that moment where it seems as if all is lost and then it's restored to you in particular, if it's restored to you after you've done some heavy praying. <laughs> right, right. And also some, it's restored to you with God. <laughs> in an actual church. You're like literally yeah. in a church when it happens. You're literally taking the sacrament when it happens. Like the whole thing, he set up the whole thing in such a way that's like, he's like, she's had enough of this. I think it can happen now. And 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 mm, it's wild. It's wild. This fucking... So I get the feeling, I get the impression that, that Father Paul literally feels it as she pulls past, as she wheels past him, you watch him watch her. Mm-hmm. And then he's staring at her intently from the, from the pulpit once he's in the church. But I got the impression he literally feels it in her body. Yeah. He goes, I wonder she if, doesn't know yet. It's I wonder if I went now. back and, and rewatch, rewatch that, those, that scene, if there's any place where he sees like movement in her legs. Mm, that's a good call. See, because I had missed, you, you mentioned it earlier in this episode where you actually see Bev drop the hot dog. Oh yeah. I've, I'd never saw, even though I've watched this now like three times recently. I mean, you see, I it's like a hand, a hand dropping yes. this hot dog. Yeah. But you see that same hand when she's making the plate right before. So yes, like it's made pretty clear, like oh, what happened there. And I just missed it. Bitch. So there might be there might be a little tremble of the toe or something yeah, like that I've in a previous watched, scene. I've never watched that scene with that in mind. So that's yeah. something when I go for my you know twenty second, twenty third watch of this, I will uh, pay attention <laughs> to. <laughs> Folks, here's here's my point though. I want you to put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself right. in Lisa's shoes or her mom and dad's shoes. When they do things later in this series, when they and others do things later in this series, 
ask yourself, like, could you be talked into something if you mm. had been there for an event like this? I think I think that's one of the things that makes this show so compelling, honestly. Yeah, it is. Is because all of the, other than Bev, all of the characters are very endearing. Yes, and, they're good people. And, they're not, you know, like, yes. this isn't, these people are not, this this town is, is, a, <laughs> is not filled with monsters. No. Until, it, uh, you know, it's, like. It's like the town is the monster. It's like the place has gone bad and yeah. is and is sucking the goodness out of the people as it goes. It's a very interesting situation. It is. Um, it is. It's very oof. And it's, yeah, everything that, it, and the next episode's really great because this is where we get, like, yeah. this is where kind of the big reveal is, you know, is in the next episode. And so um, we're all, it's all, this miracle is pushing us into some really, really, amazing shit in the next you know the next episode i i am so enjoying this and i'm glad to hear that others are we got all I that too. great feedback Yay. that we talked about earlier but like genuinely i think i think there are already some new people that have found us because of the flanagan thing so kudos and so. welcome in if you are if you are new if you haven't been listening to us previously let us know in the comments that you just you just joined on for this yeah and um and, and welcome we'll try to keep our Anne rice talk to a minimum during these episodes so that you you won't be too confused on what we're talking about and i hope we've done a good job so far and we'll try to do this too moving forward we're gonna try hard not to spoil things for you episode know, to episode so through bad. this series i'm the yeah. worst well, no. about this show no just because i've watched it <laughs> so many freaking times it's really hard for me but i will try to do better yeah well there are there are certain things i think that that are, are clearly being hinted at or, or said oh yeah you know, subconscious levels and we'll we'll point those out even if we won't talk about the specifics of what that's hinting at or, or what will be revealed anyway um stay tuned lots of great stuff to come this this series Absolutely. goes very interesting places and uh and then i also want to remind you when we wrap this series up our next topic of conversation is going to be the new uh salem's lot adaptation oh, from max so excited. Uh, that's going to premiere on october 3rd uh, on max so you've got almost a full month to watch it we'll do it as our first episode of november so excited it's i love this time of year for watching creepy spooky shit it's just the i mean i watch creepy spooky shit all the time but man we're in the in the ber months i'm here for it uh speaking of what what are you watching right now what else are you watching that we're not talking about ashley or you got anything oh, interesting going on um you know i've been i have a big fan i'm watching uh the newest season of taskmaster just started i don't know oh, if any nice. of you guys are taskmaster fans um it is a british uh kind of game show sort of situation where they have five comedians that have to perform tasks, little like puzzle solving things and, and creative problem solving things. And it's fucking hilarious. And I love it so much, but the, I think it's like the 17th or 18th season has just started. If you haven't watched it, Joel, you need to, you would love hey, it. Oh I my thought God. It was a cooking show. I don't no. know why I thought it was a cooking show. Mm -mm, no, it's crazy, hilarious shit. I love it so hard. I can't it believe so I haven't seen it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I it's thought, so I honestly much fun. Got it. I, thought, I thought it was like a British Iron Chef, honestly, no, is no, what I thought it was. No, Oh, no, it's <laughs> no, it's so funny. It's, it's hilarious. It's just people being put in these incredibly ridiculous situations and have to think their way out of it. It's just, and they're all so funny because it's all just really brilliant, funny comedians. It's nice. excellent. Yeah. So I just finished my watch of Shogun, the new uh, <gasps> miniseries from FX. I say miniseries. I... It's going to be a series. There's going to be a second season of that. Yeah. Um, did and you see it? won like every fucking Emmy. Won everything it was up for. It <laughs> basically swept. It, it, yeah. it broke. No, it didn't break the, um, the bear broke the thing for comedy, I think. I don't think, I don't yeah. think, uh, oh no, I do know what it, it, it won the most Emmys since Game of Thrones went off the air. Uh, and Ooh, maybe awesome. beat Game of Thrones record too, but it deserved every single one of them. That is an amazing yet, series. It's, it's on our list of shit to watch for sure. Like the acting, the writing, the cinematography, top notch across the board, and a really, yeah. really compelling story too. I'm I'm gonna go back and watch the '70s miniseries now, and I'm probably oh. gonna end up reading the book too because apparently this the '70s miniseries focuses on a few things that the new one doesn't, and it leaves out a few things that the new one puts in, and so there's you know some pieces you can get a different view of it. But also That's the awesome. book is apparently amazing too. So anyway, I'm gonna do all of those. The other thing though that I did want to mention, and I'm sure everybody but me already knows about this i started watching the sherlock series from bbc i mm, yeah it's 
so damn good. I don't yeah. know why it took me this long to finally get to. I mean, one, re- they're 90 minute episodes, right? Well, Each episode is its own movie. There's so much shit to watch. There's so much yeah, shit to watch. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff out there. And I have but terrible it's a... ADHD, so I rewatch shit all the time. I'm like a <laughs> terrible. Yeah, no. Well, it's comforting. It's comforting to yeah. go into something that you know what it's going to do to you, right? Instead of exactly. being surprised by the strings that it pulls. Yes. Um, but this one has some interesting social commentary going on in it throughout, a little bit of the background. Very compelling mysteries. And the two lead actors are just wonderful together their chemistry is is outstanding oh yeah I, again they're so good everybody knows sherlock is good everybody has already watched it except for me i'm apparently told i only need to watch the first two seasons and then i need to let it go but um <laughs> apparently it's not I, so great after that i think i've only watched like the first half of the first season for the very reason that it's just like an hour and a half each episode it is Ooh. it's a 90 minute movie every time i have know? been doing a quick and dirty just rewatch in the background of Shit's creek which is just nice the, one of the best like comedy like sitcom half hour shows of the last Man. like 30 years i love it so hard so amazing the, there was like a one-two punch a few years apart i guess of that and just as that was wrapping up ted lasso started on apple yeah. tv and yeah both they don't really have anything in common but both of them are very positive that same vibe communal yeah. comedies yeah yeah and that that was like yeah, I missed that, honestly. I don't have anything that I'm watching like that currently. Maybe I'll start yeah. watching Shit's Creek again, too. <laughs> it's good for the soul. A little palate cleanser, you know? I have to have a little palate cleanser between all the horror and true crime I consume. Right? Right? Exactly. All right. Well, we will be back to talk about more horror, true Absolutely. crime, sadness, alcoholism. We're here for and, it. Yes. We're here uh, for religious it trauma. <laughs> um, to give us your feedback let us know what you think about this episode and this series overall and do let us know if you're a new listener to the show we appreciate oh, you yeah, please. thanks to everybody and we'll be back again soon with uh, book three of Midnight Mass until then we have been your hosts I'm Joel I'm Ashley and we are the Articulate Coven thank you for watching Flan Again a Mike Flanagan rewatch from the Articulate Coven. If you want our videos and audio early and ad-free, visit articulatecoven.com join and join the coven.